Well, today we are beginning a, a brand new series called uh, Great Relationships, and I'm excited to share this with you. We're going to look at some biblical wisdom and, and just some practical tips of how to take every single relationship that you have in life and just take it to brand new levels, whether it's your marriage relationship, your relationships with your family, your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors, whoever it is. And, and part of the reason I want to do this, and if we can bring me down just a little bit, guys, in the house, thanks. Uh, it, I wanted to do this because, you know, we are about two years now into, uh, you know, the, the start of the, the COVID pandemic and, and the, the very first time, you know, we even ever heard that word COVID. It became a part of, of our vocabulary. And what I've shared with you in the past is this has become a, a pandemic, not just of a sickness. This has become a pandemic of loneliness. That many people, you know, we got isolated for so long that people don't know how to interact with one another anymore. And I don't know if you've seen any of the statistics, but depression and suicide rates are at all-time highs. Divorce rates and breakups and relationships are skyrocketing. And again, it's because people just, they haven't been able to remember how do we actually interact with each other. And so that's what I want to take the next couple of weeks to, to look at, okay, how do we interact better in our relationships? And so, you know, there, there's a very fascinating uh, little phrase that's in Scripture, and it says this, I will be with you. 26 times in Scripture, we hear this phrase, I will be with you. Now, the obvious question is, who is saying it, and who's going to be with whom, right? I will be with you. Well, two times, it's actually Jesus that's before his death, and he says, I will be with you. But then he adds another little phrase to the end of it, and he says, but only for a short time. And his disciples, they're freaking out. What do you mean, Jesus, you're only going to be with us for a short time? No, don't leave. We, we need you. Stay here with us. The other 24 times, though, that that phrase is used in Scripture is God the Father or Jesus the Son speaking that I will be with you. And he's either speaking to the nation of Israel or he's speaking to us as his followers that I am going to be with you. And that is such great news that God wants to be with you and I. He says, I'm going to be with you. He says this to, to Israel. I'm going to be with you as you enter into the promised land. He says, I'm going to be with you as you face your enemies. I'm going to be with you as you worship. Jesus and his great commission. We looked at it a couple weeks ago. Remember, he said that you're to go into all the nations and baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And the, the big part of that was he said, you've got to go make disciples. Disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And the promise that he gives at the very end of the Great Commission is, and I will be with you. In other words, as we go out and fulfill the purpose that all of us have in life, Jesus promises, I'm going to be with you as you do that. It's such good news that he wants to be with us. The great theologian and author, C.S. Lewis, he once wrote this. We may ignore, but we can nowhere evade the presence of God. The world is crowded with him. He walks everywhere incognito. Listen, whether you know it or not, whether you feel it or not, whether you sense it or not, whether you see it or not, God wants to be with you. That's what Christianity is really all about, that the God of the universe wants to have a relationship with us. See, it's not that he's just with you. He wants to be with you. Isn't that good news? That God, the creator of all things, he wants to be with you. That is such, such good news. And it's important for us to, to understand this principle as we get into this re, uh, relationship series. Because until we know how much God wants to be in relationship with us, it's going to be hard for us then to know how to relate to other people and be in relationship with them. In other words, it's God himself who is the model to us of how we should do relationships. And so that's what I want to look at today as we start the series on how do we have better relationships with other people is first of all, look at who is God? And what is it that, that God does? What are some of the attributes of God? Why is it that that he is the way that he is, because once we understand what makes God tick, then it's going to be better for us and how then to relate to other people. So if you're taking notes here today, the first thing I want to say to you is this. How is God with us? Well, I'm going to actually break each of the points in a couple parts here, but uh, point number one, just the first half of it is that God the Father is watching over me. Again, God the Father is watching over me. 
over and over and over and over again throughout Scripture, we see that God says, you know what? I am like your father, and I'm watching over you to lead you and to guide you and protect you, to comfort you, to provide for you, to give you support. The author of the book of Hebrews is actually quoting Moses in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. He writes this, God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Now, any of you English majors out there, were any of you English majors, you're like really into it? Because what you realize here is this is actually bad English. This is a double negative. You're not supposed to do that. Can't have two nevers. But let me let you in on a little secret here. In Greek, it's actually worse. If you look at this verse in the original Greek, it's not a double negative. It's actually a quintuple negative. Five different times God uses the word never. In other words, I think it's almost like he's trying to say, look, people, listen, 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 listen. You online, listen. God's going, I will never, ever, 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 ever leave you. I will never, ever, 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 ever abandon you. He's trying to get that point across to you that he wants a relationship with you. And that he's like a father watching over you. Listen, I, I know COVID may have isolated you. And there's people in your life, relationships that you have where maybe they let you down. But God will never, ever, 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 ever leave you nor abandon you. He's always looking for a way to help you, which leads to the second part of uh, point one. That God the Father is watching over me. How is he doing it? He is watching over me for provision. That's what God the Father is doing. He's watching over us for provision. How many of your parents? Let me see you raise your hand. How many parents we have out there? Okay. Parents, isn't this what you do for your kids? You watch over them. You provide for them. You lead them. You guide them. You provide them comfort in all that is needed. You give them food and clothing and shelter. When it's time for them to head off to school, what do you do? You go out to the Target. You get them a little backpack, right? You get them their little lunch box. You make their little peanut butter and jelly sandwich and their chips, and you put the pickle in, right? You put it in the lunch box. You provide everything for your kids. Send them off to school. <laughs> and as they get older, you, you continue to provide for your kids. You're there for them in every single way. You're there when they fall down to help pick them back up. You're there to correct them when they do things wrong. And that's what God does for us. He is watching over us like a father. Now, I know some of you are going, but okay, go it, but I still feel alone, though, when it comes to, to God sometimes. Yes, he, he may be a father that's, that's watching over me, but I don't really feel him. I don't really sense him. Well, that's why the second thing happened. Number two on your outline, Jesus was with us. So God the Father, he's watching over us. Jesus came and he was with us. Now, I know last week was Easter, but let me actually take you back to Christmas. What's the story of Christmas? It's that God became one of us. 700 years before Jesus was born, the prophet Isaiah, he had prophesied this great thing about what the Messiah would be like when he came. And then Matthew and his biography of Jesus, he quotes Isaiah. Look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. A virgin will have a baby boy, and he will be called what? He will be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Now, quick little Hebrew lesson for you here. Take that, and, and guys, keep, this, keep the verse up on the screen for the people at home so that they get to, to see this. I know in the room you always see it behind me, but they don't always see it on the screen. But keep it up for a second. I am there. See that at the beginning of Emmanuel? Okay? That means with in Hebrew, I am. Now, we would pronounce I am as I am, right? But it's actually M in Hebrew, okay? So that's with. Let's go to the end of it, Emmanuel, E-L. E-L is God. And the manu in the middle in Hebrew is us. So with us, God. 
Emmanuel, with us, God. It wasn't his name, it was what he was going to be. It, people call you all kinds of things, right? They call you neighbor, they call you father, they may call you mother, they, they call you a co-worker. So we all have these different titles. This was a, the title that his name would be Jesus, but Jesus was going to be Emmanuel, the only one who could ever, ever have that title. God with us. How much did God want to have a relationship with us? He became one of us. Why? Because sin had separated us from God the Father. And so he said, I'm going to become one of them. I will be God with us. I will be God with them, he says. Again, that, that's how much he wants a relationship with you. That Jesus was not only God, but he was also fully human. And that's what the, the Christmas story is, is about, that, that God was born in the to, to flesh and blood like us. And he could relate to us. Jesus had poopy diapers. Jesus got hungry. Jesus got tired. Jesus had to go to school. Jesus counseled people. Jesus taught people. Jesus loved people. He was just like us. But you know the one thing that made him different than us? Was that he was God, and so therefore, he could live a perfect and sinless life. That's something you and I can't do. He lived a perfect and sinless life. And therefore, he was able to do the, the second part of, of point number two, that Jesus was with us. Why? For sacrifice. Jesus was with us for sacrifice. And that's what we celebrated last week. That Jesus, God in the flesh, lived a perfect and sinless life, and he died on the cross. He shed his blood as a sacrifice for our sins so that our sins can be forgiven so that we can have a relationship with him. Remember, that's what God wants most from you. Not rules, not regulations, not rituals, not your religion. He doesn't want any of that. He wants a relationship with you. And it's only Jesus, his sacrifice on the cross, that makes that relationship possible. So Jesus was with us for sacrifice. Not only can we live forever, eternity. We can live free of the power of sin right here and right now. Now, again, many of you are going, okay, Gilbert, that's great. God is watching over us. Okay, I understand that, but I still don't always feel that. I don't feel like I'm in a relationship. And Jesus was with us, but Gilbert, Jesus isn't like here today, like wandering around and stuff, or he's not somewhere in the, in the world that I can go and like visit Jesus. You're saying he was with us, so I still don't feel like connected to him. Well, that's the third part. And the good news is this. Number three there on your outline. And that is that the Holy Spirit lives in us. The Holy Spirit lives in us. On the night that Jesus was crucified, he was together with his disciples. We've talked a lot about that over the last couple of weeks. You know, they did the feet washing and the communion and all those types of things. Jesus prays for his disciples, he prays for himself, he prays for us. But a part of that whole conversation, we read this in John 14, 16 to 17. Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. He lives with you and will be with you. Remember how I said to you at the beginning of the message that Jesus a couple times said, I will be with you, but only for a short time, and the disciples were freaking out? Well, this was his answer to that. He's like, I'm going to be with you, but only for a short time. But good news, guys, I will actually send my spirit to come and live inside of you. That you don't have to physically have me in the room in order to be in a relationship with me because you have my spirit in me. And we talked about that last week. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead now lives inside of you who call yourselves followers of Jesus. If you have prayed and you've asked for his forgiveness, you've asked him to take control of your life, you've turned from your sins. If you've done that, at the very moment you prayed that prayer, his spirit now came and started to live inside of you. 
the very Spirit of God. Isn't that good news? That God's Spirit is with us at all times and in all ways to lead us and to guide us and to direct us in the ways that we should go. Now that word advocate that Jesus used there isn't one that we use a lot in our modern day like English. But advocate simply means to speak up for somebody else, to, to plead on behalf of someone else. And that's what the Holy Spirit does for us. He speaks to the Father on our behalf. He pleads for us. In fact, at one point, Jesus and, and Paul even, the, uh, both of them said that when we don't even know what to say, the Spirit will speak through us then. The Spirit will give us the words. The Spirit is there to help you in all things to coach you in the path that you should take, to, to correct you and, and to convict you when you're veering off the path. And here's the cool thing. Since the Holy Spirit is in you, He's always going to meet you where you're at. In other words, the Holy Spirit's going to customize a game plan for you so that no matter what you need in life, the Holy Spirit is right there at that time, sees what you need and says, okay, I'm going to help you. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, there are some like big things, like macro things, that's the same for all of us. Like the Great Commission. All of us are called to make disciples and make disciples and make disciples and make disciples. What I'm talking here is the micro things in your life. That whatever it is that you need in the moment, that's what the Holy Spirit is going to do for you. Why? Because you're in a relationship. And He loves you. And He wants to help you and care for you and provide for you. And so that's why your walk with Jesus and my walk with Jesus is going to look different. Because what you need right now and what I need right now are two different things. But the good news is the Holy Spirit lives in us and will give us exactly what it is that we need. And what is it that we need? Well, number three, the second part, the Holy Spirit lives in us. Why? For empowerment. Again, whatever you need in the moment, the Holy Spirit empowers you with that. If you need words... He'll empower you with the words to speak. If you're feeling overwhelmed in life right now, the Holy Spirit will empower you with a peace which surpasses all human understanding. Whatever it is that you need, that's what the Holy Spirit does for you. If you need guidance in what to do next, the Holy Spirit empowers you with wisdom. All right, so that's who God is. We have God the Father. He's doing what? He is watching over us. We have Jesus the Son who was with us. And we have the Holy Spirit who is in us. The question you have is, what does that have to do with me and my relationship with my mean neighbor or my cranky coworker? <laughs> Notice I said it's your neighbors and your coworkers. None of your family members are like that. <laughs> so what does... God over us, God the Father over us, and, and Jesus who is with us and the, the Spirit in us, what does that have to do with our day-to-day -day relationships? Well, simply put, who God is is to be the model for us and how we interact with other people. You're going, Gilbert, you're going to have to explain that more. I still don't understand. Okay, let me throw out a couple like big, big theological words at you, okay? Don't worry, I'm going to explain them each to you, but I think this, this will help you. So the first one is this. They're on your outline is that, uh, uh, again, the, the, these are attributes of God, that omnipotence, that God is all-powerful. Now, the, the little prefix there, O-M-N-I, omni, means all, okay? So all-powerful, all-potent, that is God. He is all-powerful. He had the power to create the heavens and the earth. He has the power to part the seas. He has the power to raise the dead, to heal the sick. God is all-powerful. Here's the next one omniscience, all-knowing. God is all-knowing. Now, as you look at that word, notice the omni, which means what? All. But then what's the actual next word there? We, we pronounce it omniscience, but what's the next word? Science. So God is all science. God knows all things about all things. So, Every form of science, every ology is a subset of theology. So biology, the study of the, the human body, God is all-knowing. 
Why? Because he created it. God knows every single hair on your head. Now, for some of us, it, you know, <laughs> he's slacking a little bit. <laughs> Others of you, you, you make up for it. You got a full head of hair. But he knows every hair on it. But it's not just the hairs on your head. He knows every single strand of DNA that's inside of you. How does he know that? Because he knit you together in your mother's womb. How about cosmology, the study of the stars and of the universe? That's a form of theology. Why? Because God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. God knows exactly how many stars are up there in the night sky. Why? Because he created it all. Psychology. God knows it all. He knows your your deepest fears. God knows your greatest dreams. He knows your mind. So God is omniscient. He is all-knowing. And then the, the final word then is omnipresence. That God is all-present. Now, if you look this up in the dictionary, it's going to say it's the concept of God being everywhere all the time. And that is true, that God is everywhere all the time. But a lot of times we think, well, because God's everywhere all the time, that means he's sort of like aloof to what's going on because he has like so many things to do, right? But remember, he's God. He's not you. I mean, you're, you're, you are like time and space. You, you are locked into that. God, God is above that. God created time and space. He exists outside of our time and space. That's why, you know, in Scripture we read that for God, like a thousand years is like a day to us. Because he doesn't operate the same way that we do. But when it comes to God's omnipresence, here's the thing. It's not that he's got like just so many things to do so he doesn't care about me. No, 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 no. What you got to realize is God is omnipresent. That means he is with you all the time. That's good news. He's with you as you're sleeping. He's with you as you're driving. He's with you as you head off to work. He's with you as you're dealing with your cranky neighbor. He's with you everywhere that you live, you work, and you play. God is with you. And remember, we are created in the image of God. So God the Father who watches over us, Jesus the Son who was with us, the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And listen, you're never going to be, you know, all the omnis of God. You're never going to be everywhere all at once. You're never going to be all powerful. You're never going to be all knowing. But yet you were created in his image. And so we need to take those things about who God is and start to apply it to our lives. You're going, okay, Gilbert, help me out. How, how do we do that? Well, let me give you a couple tips here. Number one on your outline, and it's simply this. I can't be present without being available. Again, I can't be present without being available. You know, let's be honest. Oftentimes when it comes to our immediate family, it's easy to be like God the Father with our immediate family. In other words, we're like, my job is to provide, to give you things, to give you clothing and shelter and food. And so we're, we're very good at, at being providers and supporting in that way. But how many of you know that there's more to relationships than just providing stuff for people? Even if it is your kids or your spouse. There's more to a relationship than just giving things and providing things. I mean, all of us, we know, and we've, we've heard the stories of, you know, a, a guy, he was super faithful to his wife. He provided his wife and kids with a big house and a fancy car and, and all kinds of stuff. They had all the stuff, but yet they still ended up getting a divorce. Why? Because they weren't getting what they wanted most. And what did they want most? Him. Time with him. He was so busy out providing that they never actually had him. Or we've all heard stories of, you know, uh, adult children 
that they hate their mom. Why? Not because she didn't provide, because she gave them like all the, the latest iPhones and, and you know the Xboxes and all that kind of stuff. They never lacked for money for the latest sports equipment and, and you know, the, the stuff for, you know, whatever girls, what do girls do? I, I guess they, 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 they dance and what do else do girls do, right? I mean, uh, you know, they, they had the stuff. They had the dresses. They had the clothes. They, they had all the stuff. See why I don't have kids? <laughs> I wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> I'd be like praying, please let it be a boy. <laughs> I don't know how to deal with a girl. <laughs> I don't know what they need. But, but, but that's, that's the thing. We all know, we all know of, of adult children who hate their mom because she provided all this stuff, but she didn't provide a relationship with her. And again, this, this goes into all of our relationships. It's not just about being a provider. Yes, God the Father is over us and he's watching us and he's providing for us. But remember, he took it a step further. And what did he do? He entered into our world. He became Emmanuel, God with us. And why was Jesus with us? He was here for sacrifice. Jesus came to sacrifice. And we've got to do the same thing. We can't just be like God the Father and just be a provider. We've got to be like Jesus the Son. We've got to sacrifice for the people that we love so that the relationship can be there and be strong. And so what's that going to look like in your life? Well, you've got to enter into the world of the people that you're close to. So parents, what does that mean? It means you enter into the world of your child. You get down on the floor with them there, and, and you play. You enter into their world of make-believe, of you know the dragons or Barbies or whatever it is. You're entering into their world. You're sacrificing your time, your energy, to be in their world. Again, that's what Jesus did for us. He left the comforts of heaven. He sacrificed the comforts of heaven to come to us. And ultimately, he sacrificed his own body so that we could have a relationship with him. What else is this going to look like? Husbands and wives, you need to enter into the world of your spouse. What is it that they find valuable? What is it that they find interesting? What is it that they like to do? You sacrifice your own time and effort and money and resources and stuff. You sacrifice to enter into their world to relate better to them. It's not about your needs and your wants and your desires. We all have to sacrifice and enter into the world of our neighbors and our coworkers, our family members. Enter into their world. Sacrifice what we want. And yes, that short-term sacrifice, that does hurt us because we aren't getting what we need. But here's what you're going to discover. Long-term, all of your relationships are going to skyrocket. All of your relationships are going to go to deeper and deeper levels of satisfaction than you've ever had before all because you were willing to become like God and say, you know what? It's not just about watching over and providing for you. No, I'm going to become like Jesus the Son and I'm going to sacrifice so that you have what you need the most. All right, so that's tip number one. Tip number two then is I can't be available without being vulnerable. So again, number one was I can't be present without being available. Well, you can't be available unless you are vulnerable. So tip number one was, you know, it's easy for us to become like God the Father and be all about providing, but we got to become like Jesus the Son and sacrifice. This is more like the Holy Spirit then, that it's easy, especially for you ladies, and I'm being a little stereotypical here, but ladies, typically, you're a little bit more nurturers than what we guys are. And you love to, to come alongside and assist and, and to empower. You love to serve. But there's more to a relationship than just that. Because here's the thing. I've met people, and especially some ladies through the years, that have been absolutely fantastic servants. They give and they give and they give and they give and give of their time. But yet they're some of the loneliest people that I know. Even though they're around people all the time because they're serving them. But the reason that they're lonely is because nobody actually knows the real you. You see, what happens oftentimes is when you're a nurturer, you need to be needed. That's a pride issue. And so you don't let people serve you because you're constantly serving. 
here's what we need to understand. We've got to get vulnerable. We've got to get to the place that say, you know what? Sometimes I need some help. And really, if you think about it, you're actually hurting, especially your like close family members and friends, you're actually hurting them when you don't become vulnerable. Let me share with you why. If you're not vulnerable, then they're trying to serve you, but only a version of you because they don't actually know the real you. You've put on a mask, you've put on a, a facade, and you're pretending to be somebody that you're actually not. And so they're trying to serve this person that they think that you are, but that's not actually who you are. And so now you feel even lonelier because your needs aren't actually being met, but yet your pride is saying, nope, I'm good. And so eventually you will break with that. You will get hurt by those that you love because you're like, why aren't they serving me in the way that I need? Again, eventually you will get to that place where you're like, I need to be served, but they're not serving you in the way that you need because they don't know the real you. So we've all got to get vulnerable. Remember, Jesus, he was with us for sacrifice. He entered into our world. He became vulnerable. Jesus knew from the very moment he was born into this world, his vulnerability, that he was going to be crucified, that he was going to get hurt. But yet he still did it anyway. Why? Because relationships are so important to him. And so we can't just be like the Spirit in our relationships. We can't just keep empowering and all we're doing is serving got to get to the place where we're vulnerable with people that we're close to as well sharing the real us being transparent all right so again that that's our motto god the father watches over us jesus the son was with us for sacrifice the holy spirit in us for empowerment and so we need to provide like the father we need to empower like the spirit but most of all, we need to become like the Son. We need to sacrifice for the people that are in our lives. And you're going to see your relationships go to new levels. But you've got to be present. And you've got to be available. And you've got to be vulnerable. So let me give you just a couple challenges that I want you to, to implement into your life. Three things that you can do to help you with what I uh, shared today. The first thing is this. I want you to eat at least one meal per day with family members where there are no screens, no exceptions. At least one meal per day with family. Or maybe you're single, you know, maybe you're going to get together with somebody else. One meal per day. No screens, no exceptions. Now, look. This is a miracle of God, these little devices. You realize there's more information and more technology in your cell phone than what they use to send the first men to the moon. Seriously. There's more powerful. So this is powerful. This is such a great device. But remember what I've talked to you about before with like fire? That the fire is sort of neutral. Fire can either heat up your house or burn down your house. It just depends on what you do with it. It's the same thing with these. These things are so powerful. Anything you want to do, you can just Google, you know, or, or Siri, you know, tell me about this. Earlier, I, you know, we needed something bend in the tech booth, and I was like, turn on flashlight, you know, and the flashlight came on. All kinds of things. So these are very, very good. But you know what? They're also very deadly. Because they've taken our, our relationships that we're supposed to be having face-to-face and just go out to a restaurant today and watch the people sitting at the tables. Most of them are sitting there looking at their phone the whole time. We have got to get back to the place where we're doing real face-to-face -face interactions with one another. 
Because a lot of you, you, you sit at a computer screen all day long, side by side with coworkers. So don't make that mistake when you get home of just a lot of screen time. So at least one meal per day, no screens, no exceptions. No TV screen on, no phones at the table. You're just having face-to-face -face interaction with one another. Is that going to be a sacrifice? Yes. Is that what we talked about today? That we need to learn to sacrifice for our relationships? Yes. All right, so that's the first one. Number two, at least one night per week where the TV never gets turned on and I participate in activities with others. So maybe with your family or your friends, you're going to do games. Maybe you're going to do a puzzle. Maybe you go out and take a hike or a bike ride. Whatever it is, just make sure, again, it's face-to-face -face interaction, not just sitting side-by-side -side with somebody watching something on the screen. Which sort of leads to the third point then, and it's this. At least one day per month doing a group activity that is not a movie. Now, listen, I love movies. Movies are great. But when we go out with a bunch of friends and we go to a movie, what are you doing? You're sitting side by side watching a screen. That's not real interaction. That's not building relationships. So get together with your friends. Play a game. Go to a game. Do an escape room. Take a hike. Go to a museum. And listen, you don't have to spend any money. Just the very fact that you're being present together, that you're being available for one another, that you're sacrificing the screens, that you're truly being vulnerable with one another, it is going to take your relationships to brand new levels. So again, what is the model? God the Father over us for provision. Jesus the Son with us for sacrifice. The Holy Spirit in us to empower us. We need to do all three of those things. Provide for people, that's going to help in a relationship. We need to empower people. That's going to help in a relationship. But the biggest thing you can do is sacrifice for people. It's not about you. It's all about them. And how are we going to do that? We're going to be present. We're going to be available. And we're going to be vulnerable. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the wisdom that is found in your word. And Lord, as we uh, go through this series over these next five weeks, and we're looking at how do we take our relationships to brand new levels, and we get very, very practical in being less critical with one another and, and just all these various things that we're going to talk about. Lord, I, I just pray that, Lord, your, your spirit that is in us would just be correcting us in, in the, the, the ways that we have veered off track. Lord, since relationships are the most important thing to you, help relationships be the most important thing to us as well. That it's not about money, and it's not about fame, and it's not about power. None of those things really matter. What really matters is relationships. So help us to make the sacrifices that we need to make in order to grow our relationship better with you and our relationship with one another, especially those that are closest to us, our closest family, our closest friends. Help us to go into new levels of friendship that we've never, ever had before. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.